Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Stephanie, for uh, allowing me uh, to make this presentation today. And um, uh, we've had a great year with the Mississauga Board of Trade. So uh, we look forward to that continuing relationship. Uh, let's talk about exit strategies for private business. And um, I have a lot of material to cover today. So some of it I'm going to flip through quickly. And uh, some of it I'll spend a little bit more time on. And uh, it is, as I was preparing for this presentation, a very complex topic and um, lots of rabbit holes um, and minefields to walk through. So we're, we're going to go through that. Uh, and, and where the perspective that I'm bringing to the conversation today is real live M&A transactions, merger and acquisition transactions that are happening, you know, today as we speak in our office. And you know our, our firm has handled a you know a small transaction, a sale of shares of, of a business for three hundred thousand dollars, and we're presently working on a two hundred million dollar buyout. And the issues between three hundred thousand and two hundred million are virtually the same. But the scale of the business is different, but uh, these are complex areas, and I look forward to taking you through some of the real life stuff that that we're seeing in our practice today. Let's take a look at our agenda. Um, I want to talk a little bit about preparing your business for sale. Uh, uh, I meet a lot of clients that uh, want to sell their business, but they're nowhere near ready. So let's spend a few minutes talking about how you get ready to get ready to sell. Uh, we'll spend another you know minute or two on business valuation. And um, business valuation is a complex topic in and of itself. And uh, I did touch on it in my previous webinar where we talked about tax strategies for, you know, private corporations, but we'll just give a, a give us a little recap on business valuation issues. Then we're going to go through kind of the, the, the different ways of selling a business. So we're going to talk about a sale of assets of the business. Then we're going to talk about a sale of shares of the business. And I, and, you know, here, here's an early tip. Like Everybody wants to sell the shares of their business and to take advantage of uh, an individual's lifetime capital gains exemption, right? So we, we will all know or remember that we can exempt almost a million dollars of capital gain if we can trigger a transaction that uses a, somebody's lifetime capital gains exemption or an individual's lifetime capital gains exemption. We'll touch briefly on, on a hybrid sale. Uh, and, and I'll take you through a, a few things about a, a management buyout. Um, again, something we're working on in real time in our office, and I'll kind of explain what, what that looks like. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about, you know, family business considerations. Uh, that's been a topic for me um, since I graduated from the University of Waterloo and, and did my master's project on ownership and management succession of the family owned business, the, 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 the very complex area, um, very interesting area. And I know that, um, you know, the audience today will include a lot of family business owners. And I should also uh, mention, I'm going to touch a little bit on Bill C-208 um, that the federal government brought brought in in uh, 2021 and some, and how that changes the landscape of selling shares or making intergenerational transfer of shares uh, of a family business or a family farm corporation. So we'll talk, so lots of material. And um, yeah, please stop me at any time and, and ask me questions so you just don't hear my droning out of my voice for 45 or 50 minutes in a row. So we are a full service tax and accounting firm in downtown Streetsville. Uh, we're a CPA firm that leads with tax. Uh, we only work with private corporations and the entrepreneurs that run them. And the key points of difference of our firm versus other firms is that we have partner level attention. So you get me if you're a client of mine. Uh, we also have multiple points of uh, firm contact. And uh, our, we also have a client service team that has uh, lots of general business acumen. We get questions about everything when it comes to business. And we are a 72-person team today. And the, uh, the proud award winner of the Mississauga Board of Trades Large Business of the Year in 2023, as well as a great place to work. So there's the commercial. We're going to move forward. Our purpose at S plus C Partners is to deliver the best possible service experience and outcomes for our clients. And when it comes to dealing with entrepreneurs and private business, the outcome that they're looking for is they want to pay the least amount of tax. So we spend a lot of time talking about tax. Well, let's start talking about preparing your business for sale. And this is uh, uh, my own quote 
Uh, the easiest business to sell are those that are so well run, they could be sold in a transaction that closes tomorrow. In my experience, those well-run businesses have owners who are almost indifferent to sell. These businesses are sold for the highest price. So I think that's going to resonate and make a lot of sense with, with many of the people on the webinar today. No loose ends. Uh, I mentioned previously clients, you know, you know, they present themselves to our office and they decide that, that they want to sell and they want out, but they have loose ends. And so let's just think about, you know, what some of those loose ends are. Um, you can't sell a business as losing money and going down the tank, right? I think I think we need to have an established trend. I think we want that trend to be up or to be sideways. But if the business is 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 falling on tough times and 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 the business climate is deteriorating, and uh, we don't have excess earnings and we have losses, we're probably not going to sell that business. We're going to wind it up or we're going to go through some sort of insolvency procedure with the receiver and, and, and maybe wind it up. So again, we're talking about a business that probably has sideways to up earnings. And uh, uh, that's a trajectory that we'd like to see. Um, I uh, am a volunteer director of the Streetsville Business Improvement Association here in downtown Streetsville. And we have a lot of retail businesses that participate in that business improvement area. And a key part of their businesses is having a lease for a retail space uh, on uh, this on Queen Street here in downtown Streetsville. And so if you're going to sell your business and you want to see a continuity uh, of that business, you have to have a lease that's going to expire beyond tomorrow, beyond next month. Maybe it has a renewal term, but that's a key business contract that we should probably have in place for an orderly you know, transition or, or uh, 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 exiting of the business. When you get into a transaction and you're going through a detailed due diligence phase, you're going to want to make sure that, you know, key contracts exist. You know, are your employees all under contract? How long have they been with you? Right. A new buyer is going to want to understand what severance obligation they might be taking on or not taking on. Uh, so having those things, you know, well documented are, uh, is important before you can really sell your business. The next point, you know, talks about goodwill. Uh, you know, if I'm uh, if if I'm selling a business, I want to make sure that that business isn't all about the person that owns it, right? I want to make sure that 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 business goodwill is transferable. So it's not the Kalen McDonald show; it's the S plus C Partners show. That there's people and management and systems and processes behind the transition of the business. It's not all dependent on one guy or one gal. My um, um, a recommendation to clients on, on best practices for, you know, their financial accounting function is that, you know, I would like to see, you know, August, 2023, you know, financial results by the 10th of the following month, that would be the 10th of September. So if your numbers aren't up to date, don't sell your business, have those numbers up to date, be prepared to demonstrate performance for the last 24 months on a monthly basis or on a quarterly basis, and, and they should be pretty tight. Tax returns filed up to date, you know, that would be HST returns filed and up to date, you know, corporate minute books, you know, up to date, you know, evidencing the, the who the shareholders are, uh, who the directors are. Uh, and then, you know, back to my comment about no loose ends, uh, no ongoing legal issues or issues with the Canada Revenue Agency. Right. So I think if, if we're going to sell this business, we need to be ship shape and ready to go. And uh, we don't want to have to be explaining anything to the potential purpose purchasers about, you know, what complication may exist. So let's talk a little bit about how to figure out what our what our business is worth. And uh, uh, I will share all of my slides today uh, through Stephanie at the, the Mississauga Board of Trade. I do have a link here for some insights that we do post on our website and uh, email out to our clients quarterly. And uh, when you get the slide deck, you can click on some of this information that does exist on our website. So when we look at valuing a business, we want to understand kind of what the value drivers of the business and the way that I like to think about, you know, what a business is worth. And it's, it's about the present value of the future cash flows that are expected to accrue from a purchaser. And if we if we put the lens on a transaction of, of from purely the purchaser's point of view, they want to understand what are they getting? 
what future cash flows are they getting? And they're going to compare that to what, what they're being asked to put up or to pay for, for that business, right? So they're really interested in what the future maintainable earnings of the company, because that is what they think they are going to acquire in this transaction and will accrue to them moving forward. You know, my next point is, is you know, what are those normalized uh, maintainable earnings? And so if you picture a business that earns a million dollars a year and pays a million dollars of salary out to the president owner, uh, that's probably not a normal salary. And, and the lens to put on that issue would be, you know, how much could we pay somebody, maybe an arm's length person to run the business and operate as its president or sales lead or uh, operations lead? Uh, to attempt to arrive at a, at a at a what a normal earnings you know amount would be, uh, so we talked about normalizing adjustments or salaries, um, you know, you know one time costs, um, and maybe had to sever a long term employee and had had an excess severance payment, which was a not a you know not a normal thing. Maybe there's some element to personal, you know, expenses that are going through the business and affecting the the maintainable earnings. So, maybe the owner likes to drive, likes to drive a Porsche or a Maserati, uh, and uh, those are expensive cars, and that's an expensive automotive expense, and a purchaser probably wouldn't, you know, have to you know, have to pay that kind of thing. The next part is about a leverage adjustment. And I would say that, and and, and certainly our, our experience through the pandemic and in these last kind of three years is that the private businesses that we've been working with is they're very conservative. And, and conservative meaning they borrow money from a bank. They don't borrow a lot of money from the bank. And many of them prefer to actually just use their own cash in the business and maybe have a line of credit on the side that they may or may not draw upon or is truly only there to, you know, weather a storm or in the event of a, of a rainy day. So in that case, you know, sometimes we apply a leverage adjustment when we're valuing a business because we know that the business can carry a normal level of line of credit, for example, and that that normal level of line of credit might be backed by, you know, some amount of inventory and maybe some good quality receivables that are under 90 days in, in duration and will be collected in the ordinary course. So sometimes the conservatively run business could have a leverage adjustment, which would seek to increase the value of that business because you could take it to a bank and get a line of credit. What's a redundant asset or liability? So sometimes we see, you know, companies with lots of intercompany accounts related party loans and uh, or things like how about a Maple Leaf uh, Garden seat license, right? So maybe maybe the company over the year had the opportunity and good fortune to, well, I'll let you decide whether or not it's good fortune, but to own a Maple Leafs, you know, uh, seat ticket license and maybe they pay $100,000 for that thing. And we're not selling that as part of a transaction. And so that's an example of a redundant asset, which is, I guess, a right to purchase tickets from, you know, the Toronto Maple Leafs, but uh, it needs to be probably handled before, you know, the business is sold, assuming that, you know, that's, that's something that maybe the business owner today wants to retain. So that's an example of a redundant asset. Uh, and in my experience in a lot of business transitions is the balance sheet needs to be neat and tidy. And we'll talk a little bit about more about that. And, and usually these deals are done on a cash-free, debt-free basis. And so the purchaser is not taking on your term debt with your bank. Uh, they're not taking on the term, uh, they're not taking on the line of credit. And they're also not inheriting the cash in the bank account of the business at the time of transition. So those things are, are typically retained behind. And then the new purchaser is going to come up with uh, their own sources of capital where required. So we touched on, you know, future maintainable earnings and the lens that that's what the purchaser wants to get. And they're going to understand exchanging, you know, their cash or their purchase price for what they think those future maintainable earnings are going to be. When we, when we attempt to figure out those with precision, we, we, we build up a multiple. And I say we, I mean the chartered business valuators in our office here. But uh, they, they attempt to build up a, a multiple based on, you know, the risk-free interest rate based on the risk in their business, based on the business's growth prospects. And, and, and then they typically try to apply uh, that multiple to the normalized earnings. And so very often in a private business setting, we kind of see four to seven times earnings would be a normal you know, type of multiple. Uh, could it be less? Absolutely. Could it be more? Absolutely. Have we seen both? Absolutely. And we do see that every year. 
we talk about you know synergistic purchasers. Somebody who's a synergistic purchaser um, may pay more for your business because um, they have synergies. So maybe they're already in your business and maybe they want to acquire you to expand their pre-existing geographic location. So maybe they're all running, already running in downtown Toronto and Pickering, and they'd really like to establish an outpost in Mississauga. Uh, and that might be an example of a synergistic purchaser. Something that we've seen in our own practice over the last kind of five years is, is private equity roll-ups, where a private equity firm you know, wants to really specific a, 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 or target an industry in a specific market segment, and they'll go and acquire a beachhead company and then talk to those owners and everybody that they know and understand who the competition is, and then systematically try and take out the competition to really consolidate uh, that industry in, in one kind of player. Working capital, we could probably spend an hour talking about working capital uh, in and of itself, but that would be, you know, uh, if we looked at the accounting textbook definition, you know, the difference between current assets and current liabilities. And very often that that may or may not include cash or line of credit, but accounts receivable, inventory, the day-to-day -day moving stuff. And, and usually in any business transaction, there's a target working capital. And, and often how they arrive at the targeted working capital is they look at, well, what was your average working capital? So the difference between your current assets and your current liabilities on average over the last 24 months. And uh, uh, that would also too be normalized for, for, for unusual items, but very often any deal arrives at a target working capital and that'll end up in some sort of you know, asset purchase agreement or maybe a share purchase agreement. Redundant assets, we only want to sell what's for sale. And so we need to move, we potentially may need to move things out. We may, may need to settle some things prior to sell. Uh, and then a real big part of any business transaction is, well, what people do we get? as part of this transaction. And so is management under contract? Are they employed? Uh, very often in a big transaction, you might see um, uh, the vending company sign key uh, employees to stay contracts that if you stay and we do this deal, we will pay you some sort of amount. And so that would be almost like a bonus or a top up of salary, but it could be that the management of the business is so critical to the business's success that, um, uh, they need to be tied up. And, uh, and so we see the role of management, you know, uh, in a business. And if you're talking about an, 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 uh, being acquired by a private equity company, I call private equity companies the spreadsheet guys. And uh, they want someone who's on the ground answering the phones and running operations and being the sales leader and possibly being the president. So uh, very often they don't, uh, they want to make sure that the management team is tight. Alan, can I ask a quick question, please? Please do. Um, just wanted a little bit more understanding of the targeted working capital and its uh, impact on valuation. Um, we are, you said that most of the transactions are cash free and debt free. So typically the um, current assets minus current liability would be the targeted working capital. Does it mean the working capital that's left in the business at the time of transaction is paid for by the buyer? Or how does that work? I'm just a little bit hazy about it. Great question. Um, on, a, on a sale of shares of a business, uh, and we're going to talk about the different kinds of sale today, but on a sale of shares, usually the working capital is left behind. Why? Because all the assets in the corporation are, are, are left behind, save and accept usually cash or debt, as I talked about. And working capital is really difficult to manage, right? If you think about, you know, that's accounts receivable and maybe that's inventory and that's maybe accounts payable. And we know that in the normal operation of business, we got to pay rent every month and we got to pay payroll maybe on the 15th, the 30th and every month. And so there's usually, it's usually what I call kind of wiggle room for a company is like, you know, how, how many of those cash resources do they have to, you know, carry on the fight for the next 30, 60 or 90 days? So, where a company delivers excess targeted working capital. So, so working capital over and, up, and keep in mind, all of this is as of measured uh, measurement date, right? So we're going to sell our business at the end of this month, September 30th. And we're going to do, we're going to measure everything then, right? We're going to look at our September mm -hmm. 30th balance sheet. We're going to figure out the constituent parts of working capital. And to the extent that they exceed the target, 
then the business will be sold for more money. Got it. And you, usually that's measured and adjusted for in arrears. Uh, Got it. Okay. But usually prior to closing, maybe the 48 hours before closing, we get a sense of how close we are to, you know, to mm -hmm. the target. And, and, okay. and then to the extent that we're selling the shares and we have a target and we're delivering less working capital at closing, there's usually a deduction from the purchase price. Got it. So the valuation consists the targeted working capital, um, whatever the um, the parties agreed to at the time of uh, dra drafting the agreement, right? Correct. And, and, and working capital is a big deal. And it, it and it's almost negotiated at the letter of intent stage. Okay. So it makes the share purchase agreement that much more simple. And, and very often it could be, an, there could be an exhibit or a schedule, a calculation saying, here's what it was at the end of August. And here's how we're going to measure it again at the end of September. And there's going to be an adjustment one way or another. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Kevin. Um, would, would the business valuation considerations be different if you are targeting to buy a franchisee and you want to continue with that franchise? I, I think I think the answer is absolutely yes, and uh, because every business is unique. And I think if we're putting our lens on doing a, a, a transaction to acquire a franchise, you know, we want to understand, you know, location is a big part of a franchise. We want to understand the franchise agreement and, and what the terms of that are. Uh, maybe we want to understand, you know, what the geography or the territory of that franchise is. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that's that's an important consideration. So where, where would be the cost of the franchise? Because you will have to pay up front for the cost of the franchise. Where will that sit? So are we talking about, you know, um, buying a franchise from scratch from the franchise or, or are we talking about buying an existing franchise that's already been running? So from, from an existing uh, franchise, which is already running. Because yeah. Yeah. Value, right? So that helps with valuation a bit because we know what comparable market transactions are for that franchise, right? They're gonna they're gonna sell you their McDonald's or their Tim Hortons or their Subway for X dollars, right? And that's that kind of existing out in what exists out in the market. And then you know you'll need to understand you know what the existing franchise you know paid for their franchise right, what the term of that franchise right is. What the requirements are in terms of funding monthly, you know, uh, marketing fees or franchise or royalty fees, and then you'll need to really understand clearly how they finance that initial capital outlay. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. This is an example, and and I'll just I'm going to gloss over this. You know, a, a normalization of earnings. We typically look back five times. Uh, we figure out what normal earnings are. We apply a weighted average um, factor to it, assuming that more recent experience is more um, uh, is uh, provides better support for what we expect the business to do moving forward. We tax it, then we apply this multiple that we've built up, and then we adjust for 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 that that business valuation. So this is kind of extracted from a real life valuation calculation in our office. And it's just meant to kind of highlight that there's some complexities here. There's some, we're looking at time. We're actually projecting what the next year is going to look like. We're waiting it, we're taxing it. We're applying a multiple to it. It's, it's, it's a little bit more uh, involved than a, a back of the napkin kind of thing. Let's talk about sale of assets. Pros and cons, advantages, disadvantages, uh, sale of assets. It's probably the simplest of the transactions to do. And uh, uh, let's understand the reasons for that. Normally, uh, the, the legal agreement is an asset purchase agreement or an APA. And uh, of course, I always recommend that you get legal help when you when you enter in, into any business transaction. But a lawyer could draft an asset purchase agreement and says that I would like, you know, the, the purchaser will acquire the following assets for the following price. And usually those are scheduled and they're agreed to. And, uh, you know, the neat and tidy thing about buying the assets of a company is that um, you can acquire them and, and 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 the old company continues on. And they've exchanged those assets for a pool of cash. Uh, if they have redundant assets, like my example of the Maple Leafs, you know, seat license, they can choose not to sell that asset. That asset kind of stays behind. 
Um, another advantage is that the purchaser doesn't step into the shoes of, of the directors and the officers of that corporation if they were to buy the shares that whatever those, however those directors or officers carried on that business before them, you know, the purchaser is unaffected because they just bought the assets. One of the disadvantages of the asset sale is, is the potential for double tax. So when a corporation sells assets, so if a corporation sold goodwill, sold its accounts receivable list, you know, sold some inventory, it would compute the tax on the sale of those specific assets. And then that money would be retained by the corporation. Then for the business owner to access those funds personally, they would need to take it out. And, and it's in the taking of that those funds out of the, of, of the corporation that they might pay tax in the form of a dividend on those proceeds. And, and of course, you know, the biggest disadvantage to the sale of assets is that there's no opportunity to use that lifetime capital gains exemption, which is, you know, almost a million dollars in 2023. Here's a little pictorial. We have we have a business owner, and the business owner owns an operating company. And and in the example of, of a sale of assets, we 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 trend, we sell the AR, the inventory, the equipment, the intellectual property, the goodwill, the whatever's on that asset purchase agreement, and we turn it into cash. And at the end of the day, the opco is still there, and the business owner is still the owner of the opco. But it looks like in my example here, the business assets you know have been sold. Any questions on the sale of assets before I move forward on that? Pretty straightforward. Let's talk about the sale of shares. This one's you know more interesting. There's another link to an insight on our website. What's sexy about this? Lifetime capital gains exemption, right? That's 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 the tax nirvana for Canadians, right? Can we can we sell a a qualifying corporation and use our capital gains exemption? And uh, like I said previously, that's almost a million dollars in 2023, and then the excess proceeds or cap uh, the excess you know, capital gain over and above that is taxed at about 27 percent. So that's pretty much the least uh, rate of tax that you're going to see uh, in, in Canada. Dis disadvantages to this transaction, well, it's certainly more complex, right? And so you think you can, you know, an asset purchase agreement, I think you could see between, you know, 15 and 20 pages. I think a, a share purchase agreement could be 20 to 50 pages and then, you know, more from there, uh, more pages from there. And, and, and that's disadvantage too, is that, you know, there's going to be a lot of representations and warranties by the vendor when they go to sell their shares, right? They're going to say that, you know, we filed all our taxes on time. We've computed all of our taxes on, on time according to rules. We run the business well. We're not aware of any environmental problems. We're not uh, aware of any employee severance issues. There's going to be a lot of representations and warranties that we've been good stewards of this business uh, in, in its transition to you. If we sell the shares uh, of a business, we're selling everything that's on the balance sheet of that business. And so, you know, very often we might need to purify or clean up a balance sheet to maybe extract, you know, assets that, that, that potentially aren't for sale. Uh, and then in my last comment here is that um, uh, they're more expensive, right? And, and I think because they're more complex, so your investment in, in your professional fee investment uh, with, with lawyers and accountants is typically is typically greater. Let's spend a minute on the lifetime capital gains exemption for QSBC shares because people understand that and they gloss over it. It's like it should qualify. But the rules here are uh, immensely complicated. And, um, you know, and, and so I, I've kind of set out kind of, you know, four or five of them here. And, and so, you know, to use the, your lifetime capital gains in, um, exemption and you need to be an individual. I need to be a Canadian resident, so Canadian resident and an individual. Uh, and you must uh, you must be selling a Canadian controlled private corporation. So I think we understand that that's not too complex. Canadian residents need to own the company that's being sold. Uh, there's a two year holding period test. And so those shareholders needed to have held that corporation for two years. There's some exceptions to that, but we won't explore those uh, in today's presentation. But the next test is there's an active asset test. And so that's during the 24 months prior to sale that more than 50% of the assets were active assets. And so, you know, if we think about what an active asset is, to me, that's inventory, accounts receivable, equipment, 
those would be examples of active assets. Goodwill, right? To the extent that we have goodwill from running our business, that would be an active asset. An inactive asset might be excess cash. You know, let's say that we've just been accumulating cash over time that the the business owner hasn't needed it personally for to fund lifestyle or any other thing, uh, any other expense in their life. And so it's just been accumulating cash and cash and cash and cash. If we have too much cash or do we have a marketable security portfolio or maybe we've, you know, used, used the, the proceeds from running our business to acquire, you know, uh, real estate investments. Those might be inactive assets and they might affect your ability to use your capital gains exemption. And then you can see in my fourth point on this slide that at the time of sale, so if we're selling our hypothetical business at September 30 at the end of this month, 90% of our assets need to be active at that point in time. So complex rules. You can imagine a, 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 a structure or an organizational chart where you have multiple operating companies may be operating in multiple jurisdictions under a common hold co. And so these rules also apply to stacked holding companies too. So you'd have to look at 50% at each level and then look at 90% at each level of the organizational chart, you know, at, uh, at the time of sale. So that's the number in 2023. And that, that number for exemption is growing with inflation. So uh, I'll let you figure out what inflation is going to be for 2023, but I think we're going to see that exemption over a million dollars uh, safely in 2024. This is a slide that I had in my presentation um, for uh, you know tax strategies for business owners uh, back in the spring, and this is the structure that we like as a firm. Um, which would appear to give us kind of maximum flexibility. And that's to have the operating company owned by a trust, could be a family trust. And, and one of the beneficiaries of that family trust is, is uh, another company. And, and what I'm trying to you know, demonstrate in this picture is that the excess profits of Opco are paid out in the form of a dividend to the trust. And then the trust distributes that income to some sort of holding company. And it's there where assets are stockpiled. Um, investment portfolios are created, excess cash is held, real estate is potentially invested in. And what that does is that keeps the balance sheet of Opco very clean. And so we never have a 50% or 90% active asset test when we go to sell uh, a company in a structure like this. This also works beautifully if we're able to sell an operating company and sell the shares that are owned by the trust. And you know what I've tried to demonstrate in this picture is if you had a family of five and uh, the patriarch you know, uh, created a family trust and that family trust owned all the shares of Opco, that we could, uh, 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 in tax planning, the sale of that, that private business, try and use up five exemptions or almost $5 million of value uh, in the actual selling of that business. Let's spend a minute on some of the common terms or, and then when I say terms, deal terms of a share purchase agreement. So what can we expect to see in a, in a share purchase agreement where we sell the share? So we're, we're, there's going to be, we're going to figure out the purchase price, right? That's going to be well-defined. We talked about very often cash-free, debt-free working capital with a target. Uh, very often there's some money set aside for a problem. And, and so that might be an escrow uh, period and maybe it's 18 months and maybe it's five or 10% of the proceeds, but it's there just in case the new owner encounters a problem uh, with, uh, you know, with the running of the business. And maybe those things are foreseen or unforeseen, but very often there's some sort of holdback or escrow uh, in a business transaction. Usually there's a down payment. Sometimes there's there's a deposit with a letter of intent. And then there's a, a, you very often a downstroke at the timing of, of the selling of the business. And then, you know, point five, the rest is 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 takes the form of a promise to pay. Maybe there's a, a vendor take back promissory note, and maybe that note is secured against the the the, the shares that were sold, or maybe it's um, unsecured. Maybe those notes bear interest or maybe they don't, but you know, normally there's uh, those are contemplated in the share purchase agreement. And then there has to be a pretty good understanding of what the owner is going to do, um, you know, post-sale. Are we going to, you know, uh, keep him or her on for some set or defined period of time well, so that they can transition the business to new management, new leadership, 
or are they done and uh, headed to Florida for the Gulf Coast and for the beach and uh, that they're going to stop working? I touched earlier on the importance potentially of stay agreements to making sure that the key members of a business stay behind in the event of a business transaction or transition. Uh, and then we did have a question on working capital and talk a little bit about working capital that we usually have a methodology, we have a measurement date, and then we have a increase to purchase price for excess capital delivered or a reduction in purchase price where um, working capital is deficient at the, at, at the time of sale. Let's talk about, you know, the intergenerational business transfer. And I think we can, um, this is new legislation and the rules are changing and the rules are changing January 1st of next year. But prior to 2021, there was a structural barrier when uh, a business was going to be sold from father to son or mother to daughter or father to nephew or father to niece. And, and that there's rules in the Income Tax Act uh, under 84.1 that would very often deem those transactions to be dividend transactions. And so if you sold your business and you received a dividend back, you were unable to use your lifetime capital gains exemption. And so I think that there was an inherent unfairness in those provisions under 84.1 that you know, a business owner couldn't take advantage of the lifetime capital gains exemption when they sold to somebody in the family or somebody that was related to them. And the definition of related in the Income Tax Act is probably a whole other webinar of itself too. But on that transition of a business to a related family member, the rules in 84.1 got triggered. So the government, you know, wisened up to that fact and they said, no, no, we're going to we're going to make changes that are going to allow for an intergenerational business transfer that's going to allow the vendor, you know, the patriarch or the matriarch uh, to take advantage of his or her lifetime capital gains exemption. So the rules came in and they were meant to equalize the, the playing the playing field here because you wouldn't want, you know, a, a father or a mother that's owning a business to have to be forced to sell to somebody non arm's length to get the preferred tax treatment. Now with this, with these rules in place, we can sell within the family and, uh, uh, and still take advantage of the lifetime capital gains exemption. January 1st, 2024, there's, there's new rules coming that are affecting these transactions. And so, you know, one of my takeaway is, today is, you know, if you're thinking about an intergenerational business transfer from, say, Gen 1 to Gen 2, maybe do it before between now and the end of the year uh, before the rules get slightly more complex. And the rules that are slightly more complex in 2024, I think they establish some timeframes on when the businesses transition. And I think what they're going after is they want a legitimate change in control uh, of the business uh, over a specified period of time so that the new owner uh, actually has control of the business and is active and working in the business. So that's that's something to keep in mind. Again, that's what I'll call you know a family business consideration, but 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 important nonetheless. Any questions on on sale of shares before before I move forward to, to talk about hybrid? Um, um, just, just a quick, quick one. Um, are these um, um, are these the same for part share sales or hundred percent share sales? Do these consideration they're they're all still the same in both cases? They do apply to 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 a full sale or a partial sale. Correct. Yep. I have a I have a question about strategy. Um, if um, I uh, have already got uh, an offer in place that I turned down, let's say three years ago. Um, do I continue um, negotiating with that interested party or do I go out to market? Yeah, gr great question, David. Um, going out to market is difficult. Right. Uh, you'd have to assess, you know, the business that you're in and you may know very well who your competitors are. And I, I think, you know, you might know some of them personally. Right. You might go to the same trade shows or conventions or whatever. So you could probably canvas the market and see who might be interested in acquiring your business. 
there's also people that you can hire out there that that will help you in soliciting the market, right? And uh, and I know of transaction advisors in Toronto. Uh, there's about 4,200 private equity firms in North America, and to the you know every private equity firm has a focus or a niche, right? So some of them will be interested in medical, some of them will be interested in professional corporations, some of them will be interested in construction. Uh, so that you can kind of reduce the number of players that might have interest from the, from the private equity side. That said, a bird in the hand is worth twice what a bird in the bush is worth. I think the, the, as the phrase goes. So, and and I, you know, for you know, David, for a lot of our clients, the business owners very they, very often they've run this business for a long time. It's their baby. They have people they care about, and and so being able to assess the qualities of the buyer up front and and understanding can the culture and what I've created here be easily transitioned to this potential purchaser. Uh, that may have value to you, right? So hiring a transaction advisor, that's going to cost you money, right? They're going to, there's usually a work fee. There's usually a percentage of the deal you're going to pay. It could be three to 5%, you know, depending on the magnitude of the deal. Uh, maybe hiring a, a good lawyer and a good accountant to work with you through an offer that you received three years ago uh, is maybe a great place to start. And, and then you getting an understanding potentially from them, like, are, are they offering me enough? You know, what do we think the value of the business is today? And uh, uh, should we close it? So, okay. Lots to think through there. <clears throat> hybrid, <clears throat> hybrid sale. Um, a hybrid sale is like a share sale and it's like an asset sale and it's often both. And, and, and then that's what I want to leave with you. It's, it's usually there's some sort of uh, pre-closing transaction where the balance sheet is cleaned up so that the company is now ready to be sold. So maybe in my example earlier, I talked a little about there's some redundant assets that we just need to find a home for or they're not for sale. Uh, maybe we need to engineer an, eng an asset transaction to get those off the balance sheet uh, before we're ready to do a share sale. So the hybrid is kind of uh, the both of uh, the best of both worlds, a share sale and, and, and a, um, uh, asset sale, uh, and they're way more complex and, and you have maximum professional fee investment in, in these hybrid sales. And uh, so there is, there are planning considerations to, to be taken, uh, uh, in a hybrid sale. And again, it's kind of the best of both words. And it's, it's really about putting an asset sale and a share sale together and having a series of transactions that lead to the eventual transfer of that business. Well, let's talk about the MBO, the management buyout. And, and we see this often with um, uh, in the family business context, right? And, and um, <clears throat> I would say that before we had Bill C-208, we saw a lot of family businesses where, you know, dad froze his interest in Opco and then he was redeemed out over time. So he froze his value in the shares of the operating company in exchange for a stream of future payments, which look like dividends over time. Now with Bill C-208, we have a little bit more planning that we're able to do. Um, here's kind of a roadmap of... Um, I've, I've put in the in the diagram here. There's a hold co. Very often in a management bio, there's a holding company, and 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 the reason for a holding company is because dividends can flow flow from the operating company to a hold co, or between connected corporations without triggering any tax. And for a corporation to be connected hold co with opco, it must have more than ten percent uh, of the shares of, of opco for it to be connected. So, this is a common structure. And, uh, you know, in, in, in my example, the strategy is, well, we take the hold co-shares that were potentially common shares beforehand, and we freeze them in favor of, uh, of a form of preferred shares. And then we're ready to be patient and for those preferred shares, you know, to be bought back over time. Sometimes Opco has the leverage or the capability or the ability to go and borrow money from a bank. And so maybe it goes to a chartered bank or the BDC or maybe management actually puts up some of their own capital and that uh, that money is you know, lent to Opco. And then Opco takes those funds and maybe it buys down an initial set of preferred shares uh, from Holdco. That's the downstroke. 
And then this kind of looks like an earnout, is that those preferred shares are going to be, you know, paid out over time. And and it's it's not unusual for the frozen shares to have a, a fixed dividend entitlement that maybe the frozen interest has a say five percent dividend uh, payable every year. And then maybe there's some sort of agreement that, you know, I'm going to be, these shares are going to be bought out over five years or 10 years or redeemed over time, barring some, you know, financial catastrophe. And, uh, and so this is patient money. So what I'm trying to, you know, evidence in my kind of slide here is that uh, management come in, uh, purchase shares of Opco directly. The uh, business owner is frozen out in the form of Holdco and that Holdco is bought, bought out over time. Key considerations for the management buyout. Uh, Got to be patient. Talked about that. Um, who controls it? Right. You have this. You know. You have the. You have the vendor. Uh, are these preferred shares going to be voting or non-voting? You know. Very often they're non-voting. I think management they want to have a say in how the place is going to be run. Um, it could be that the owner has a lot of money, a significant amount of money. Maybe that's money for his or her retirement set aside that they actually want to monetize. And so they don't completely trust management. But so control is going to be something that's probably going to be uh, negotiated in the form of a shareholders agreement. The third consideration here is, is that, you know, if we're going to borrow money, we want to make sure the interest is deductible. And so we need to make sure that there's, you know, proper planning and review of the interest deductibility rules to make sure that that, you know, potential initial borrowing to, to redeem shares is tax deductible. I make a comment about safe income and, and, and the redemption of shares, another complex topic, but company can't redeem shares ad infinitum if it hasn't had the historical profitable record to be able to do so. And, and the safe income context is what are the tax paid retained earnings of the company left behind uh, that can then be paid as dividend? Uh, MBO, you're going to need a business valuation, right, for both sides. And uh, uh, and then you need to understand, you know, what impact, you know, potentially that borrowing or that leveraging up of the operating company is going to have going forward. So very often, if we're going to borrow money from a charter bank or from BDC, they're going to have some sort of debt service covenant that says that, well, you guys got to be profitable going forward. And then you got to be able to pay our interest and you got to be able to pay our principal. And we're going to measure that quarterly or annually in arrears and, and make sure that uh, for, you know as long as the, the, the loan is outstanding, that, uh, that it gets, um, uh, that that covenant is met. So another consideration. Let's talk, or at 1048, let's talk for a minute about um, the family business, which is we know is the economic driver uh, here in Canada. There's a lot of family businesses. You know, my first point here, um, um, when you're dealing with family, you're dealing non-arms length or with related uh, persons, and it's complex. And, and what makes it complex is the Income Tax Act, you know, deems non-arms length people to be dealing at fair market value. So whenever we have some sort of transaction going on between non-arm's length people, we need to think about valuation. And so we need a valuation that's tight, that's not on the back of a napkin, and uh, that's supportable in case the Canada Revenue Agency you know, comes knocking. So that makes uh, the intergenerational transfer somewhat complex or any kind of family business you know, transaction you know, complex. You know, my, my third point is not all family members should be business owners. And uh, it might not be in the best interest of family harmony to leave your operating company to all of your children. Uh, some may be very capable, some less capable. Uh, fair is not equal. Uh, and the last thing you'd want to do is transition uh, your business to the next generation and have them fight and squabble. And uh, you can look back over, you know, history of Canadian companies, uh, Canadian Tire, the Billis family. Uh, you can look at the McCain family. Uh, and you can understand that those those you know family business squabbles ended up on the front page of uh, you know the, the financial post. Uh, so complex. Succession planning for family business. I, I think if you're going to do that, and and uh, there needs to be rules. Like, how do you get to be an employee? Do you need to work somewhere else first? How are we going to train this person up? How are we going to socialize them? How is the patriarch of the matriarch going to exit? When are they going to exit? I have clients that are in their 80s that don't trust their 50 year old children to run the business. And they've been working there for a very long time. And so if that's the case, I don't know that they can ever, you know, successfully transition to the next generation. 
you know, a big part of, 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 of exiting or selling the business is, is, is accomplishing a succession planning objective, which is, uh, you know, I built this business. I'd like to sell it, uh, so I can retire. I can use the proceeds to fund my retirement. Uh, so that might be a big, you know, goal for the, for the whole process. Family harmony is key, right? When we're dealing with the family, and and of course, uh, like in, any good business owner, maximizing or minimizing the taxes uh, in any business transaction is going to is going to be key. Uh, you know, a stat. This might be a little out of date. I haven't I haven't updated it, but you know, seventy percent of businesses don't survive the transition to Gen two, and ninety percent don't survive till Gen three. It's hard. You know, running a business is hard. Building a business is hard. Transitioning is hard. Right. And as Peter Drucker, that famous management guru, says, it's potentially a, a you know an operator's final test of greatness. So you need a plan, and uh, you need to execute that plan. So and I, and I would say that that an intergenerational transfer between family members is hard, um, but potentially still worthwhile. So a lot of material. We got about nine minutes left. You know, what questions can I help uh, answer for the team today? Thank you, Kellen. Uh, As I mentioned earlier, uh, definitely either in the chat, and I can read them out, or if you want to unmute yourself, you're more than welcome to, um, as some have during the presentation. Um, I have uh, I have a question. Um, what, generally speaking, what does a, uh, management buyout, um, or partial management buyout look like relative to just a arm's length share sale? I mean, are there, um, is there less value, um, uh, just comments about those two approaches. I mean, ultimately the the nice thing for me to do and what I'd really like to do is, is sell to key employees. I just don't know that, uh, uh, that that's possible. Yeah. So, uh, David, that's, that's a popular issue and consideration. Um, there's lots of employees that think that they should be business owners. And, and some are capable of that and some are not. And the challenge we often see with employees is they haven't got enough money. And so uh, forget why they haven't got enough money, but very often um, they think running a business is easy. Uh, it's not that risky. Uh, you know, um, you've, you've signed your, as a business owner, you've signed your firstborn over to the bank. Um, they tend to minimize the risks of, of running a business and think that they can do it, I would say is, is, is my experience. And then they haven't got enough money. So, you know, in the management buyout consideration, I, I think very often the valuation is probably you're prepared to accept less than you would on an arm's length sale uh, because their friends, their colleagues, they they there's time served. Um, you know them, you, you know their families, you went to their weddings, you want them to be successful. So you're probably not getting top dollar in a management buyout. And you're a patient kind of person and, and you're prepared to stay behind. And and very often what happens is 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 there's a there's a value that's frozen and it's probably not the top of the market valuation. It's probably something less than that. And then the reason why you freeze is that you can bring the new employees in for pennies on the dollar, right? We're, we're going to freeze our, my business for $5 million. And when you freeze it, you can let you, you allow those parties to come in for a nominal amount. I'm going to sell you 10% for a hundred bucks kind of thing. Uh, and, and you're not expecting that there's going to be a huge financial return to the vendor uh, or to yourself. And you're prepared to be patient and for the profits over time to be, to be paid to you in the form of a redemptive dividend likely. Uh, so that's that's kind of what you're you're going to see there. Yeah, I think the the key point that you make is that uh, uh, most employees don't make business owners. Yes. Thank you, um, Cal. I can ask a question on uh, valuation metrics. Um, businesses are all shapes and sizes, okay? From and from my experience in buying um, on it or having other discussions, is 
the size of the business is one thing. A multiple for a small business is not going to be as big as a multiple for a big business. They're non-linear um, in that respect. Um, the other one is growth rate. A business that's flat versus a business that's growing or a business that's declining have different valuations that should on that. EBITDA, of course, uh, on its own, but not just EBITDA in quantum, but EBITDA in percentage of revenue is another non-scalar item that I'd say onto there. And then background market trends, uh, macroeconomic uh, risks that are there. Can you comment on scales? I've thrown a few items that are down over there. I think they may be self-evident, but what's your perspective on valuation ranges and what drives them? Yeah, well, Frank, you know a lot about this topic, clearly. and. Um when you so small small transactions right? i referenced that we we helped a client you know for three hundred thousand dollars and and that purchase price was not ba based on EBITDA or multiples it was a number that would seem to be acceptable to the vendor to allow them to take most of their capital out of, of that business and so oftentimes you see people putting on valuations of some percentage of revenue or some percentage of gross margin, which is an accountant kind of offends me to the core because that's not cash flow, but it's easy. And we understand that, right? This is what we sold. This is what we're getting kind of thing. What you see with EBITDA that as you, you know, as EBITDA accumulates and gets bigger and, and probably exceeds $5 million, then the multiple really starts to go up. And I think the reason why the multiple for a business that has EBITDA up, you know, over or in excess of $5 million is you have a lot more potential purchasers. So that the, the, there's there's more people, potentially more private equity that are going to have interest in a business that is generating that kind of kind of excess cash flow. Growth rates are hard to, to measure. And so, um, and, and I'm not a chartered business evaluator, but, you know, we got uh, two down the hall and one in training. And and, and I know when I look at, at, at the work that they do and they're trying to estimate what the future growth trend is and they're looking at industry specific data and they're looking at growth, growth is hard. And, um, uh, you know, in the, the last quarter in Canada, we didn't have any growth, right? We may have entered a recession. Uh, what does that look like for 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 Q4? Who knows? Uh, Q3 even. I guess we'll measure that at the end of this month at some point. So, but growth. There's usually some assumption of growth uh, in a business valuation that that you're you're not going to flatline. You're not going to decline. Um, now, you know, someone that's putting an offer in is going to want to understand what their downside adjustment is, right? And what if we don't achieve the the budget that we have for the next fiscal year and so on, but. So there's a few comments. I, I, uh, Frank, is that helpful? Um, yeah, partly. I and mean, we've bought a number of businesses over the years um, that are out of here. And, and they, as you pointed out, small businesses are various items that you've got. And uh, once a buyer gets to a certain size, uh, a business that's too small isn't worth the trouble because it's as much worth buying a small thing as buying something that's big. And yet the, so your ROI on time doesn't, make any sense. So it's kind of, your buyer and seller have to be aligned to some degree um, or another. And some advice a friend had, and which I, uh, we're doing right now on an acquisition we just did in Ottawa, is it's a whole lot cleaner when in the buyer is buying a small business that the people in the small business just recognize right off the bat, you're not continuing as XYZ, you are now ABC, okay? And just migrate them right off the bat and you know keep the website for leads. Uh, and brand uh, stuff of the old stuff, just point them to your new website and just get them, adopt them into your family and make it part. But that, that's a different discussion. That's not the buy and sell, that's the transition um, on here, but it's critical to make the deal work. I agree. And I think we'll find in smaller businesses is they have too many loose ends, right? They just, they're not, they haven't sorted through those loose ends. They have unfinished business. They, they don't have employment contracts. They haven't got key supplier contracts or employees don't have, they just, they are more work. And, and, and I, and I think you're exactly right. I think you can expect the same professional fee investment if you're buying a $300,000 share deal or a million dollar share deal. It's, it's, it's kind of the same. Thanks. Thank you, Frank. That was a great uh, discussion question. Um, so we are at time. Um, I want to say thank you very much, Kellen. Uh, I think this is an excellent presentation. Again, it will, definitely, it will be on our website uh, in the coming days. Um, if anyone wants to connect with Kellen, I think he has 
he placed his uh, contact information. There you go. Um, or reach out to myself and I will definitely uh, connect both of you. Again, thank you very much, Tyson C Partners. Have a great day, everyone. We will see you soon at our upcoming events. Take care.